We've allowed the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Vrijheid is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijp je wat je mist. Reverse the question. Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political news is robust. The safety of journalists is We hacked into the audience and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know. Um, good evening, everybody. Warm welcome. My name is Yuri Albrecht. I'm the director of the Bali, and um, I will be uh, the um, host tonight. Um, it's a special night, a night with Simon Anhold uh, about the good country, the good country index. The good country index judges countries on its impact, the impact they have in the rest of, on the rest of humanity, on the rest of the world, on the planet. And if you, as you might have heard already, um, it's no coincidence that we're at Amsterdam because uh, the Netherlands tops the Good Country Index 2017. And that's uh, amazing, of course, for a small country like, uh, like ours. We always think that you know, we're unknown and we're very small, but no, 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 we're topping the Good Country Index. Um, so we're the goodest country, um, the best country, you could, you could possibly pro probably say. Um, well, how do you measure some, something like this, and, and how should uh, we see the role of the Netherlands in the, in the international world and our responsibility? Um, we, um, we're going to discuss this, but first we're going to listen um, um, to uh, Simon Anhold. Um, he is going to lecture, and then we're going to discuss the Good Country Index with um, Alexander Rinoy Khan and Simon Anhold. And since we're um, with a small group, we can sort of um, treat this as a brainstorm session among ourselves, you know, what the role of our country can be, could be, should be. Um, there are many people watching uh, at home. We're, uh, as, as usually, we're um, sending this out on the internet. Um, but I uh, first like to announce um, Simon Anhold. He's a policy advisor. Uh, he worked with uh, teens, with many, very ma many heads of state and prime ministers of several countries. Uh, he's been described as the prime minister whisperer. Um, his aim is to find ways of encouraging countries to collaborate and cooperate a lot more than they do and uh, compete a bit less than they do. And he's here to talk about his vision, about the Good Country Index, and the role he, the Netherlands plays in that. And you know, he's supposedly a very, very, very good speaker. I'm raising the bar here because he has, he's, has the fourth, fourth most watched uh, TED Talk uh, ever on the TED Talk uh, list. So um, uh, he's a very good speaker. Please, a warm welcome to uh, Simon Anold. I'm very, very glad that you're here, Mr. Anold. <laughs> Thank you, Yuri, and thank you very much for, for coming, for, for giving up part of your evening um, to listen to this. This is a, a huge and fascinating topic, and I'm particularly looking forward to the conversation at the end of it, which may turn into a heated argument. I hope it does, um, because these are very powerful topics and very important ones. I cannot allow Yuri's comment to go unchallenged. Um, my TED Talk is absolutely not the fourth most watched TED Talk of all time. I think the fourth most watched TED Talk of all time has 48 million views or something like that. Mine is the number four rated as inspiring. There you go. Um, a mere five million views. But um, TED is a wonderful thing, and it gets you to a very wide audience, which is, uh, which is great. And it's been very useful for the Good Country Project, which is what I really wanted to talk about. I won't talk for, for very long because I'd like to uh, get on to the conversation as soon as possible. But where this starts, um, I suppose, is with the day job that um, Yuri described and which I've been lucky enough to be doing for the last uh, 20 years or so, which is advising governments around the world on what I call their international engagement. And this is a catch-all term that's meant to capture the idea that governments, countries, have to interact with other countries and with the international community in the most productive and mutually beneficial way possible. 
And over the years doing this kind of work, uh, I've been lucky enough to be able to hear intimately and at great length the private plans of many governments about what they want to do with their countries and where they're hoping to go with them and what their preoccupations are. And one of the things that I started to notice very slowly after about 15 years was that all of these governments seemed to constantly return to the same theme, which was competitiveness. And even at the time, even 20 years ago, to me this felt ever so slightly old-fashioned. It reminded me horribly of that film called Wall Street, where men used to go around with red braces, um, attacking other people for being less rich than they were. And I found myself thinking, the idea of competitiveness between countries has probably been a useful idea. We all know that competitiveness has been responsible for lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It's created enormous prosperity. It's done an awful lot of good. And even if it hadn't, there's nothing we can do about it because it's a fundamental part of human nature. We're born with a competitive instinct, but we're also born with an empathic instinct. We are both. We have a devil sitting on one shoulder and an angel on the other. And what seems to have happened, this is my judgment at any rate after looking closely in detail at all the plans of all of these countries, is that in the last 30 or 40 or 50 or maybe even 80 years, we have come to worship exclusively at the altar of competitiveness in the way that we do governance. And I think now we're beginning to understand the price that we're paying for that. Wisdom, it seems to me, consists of being able to merge intelligently, to harmonize competitiveness and collaboration. The funny thing is that industry got this message a very long time ago. Way back in the 1970s, I remember, and that wasn't the first time. There was a lot of talk about co-optition. I think that was the horrible word that was coined. The idea being that in a certain sector of industry, you could compete and you could collaborate. In another context, you might call that a cartel, but let's leave that for a moment. The point being that you can work together and you can work against, and the world doesn't explode. And in fact, the industry benefits from it. I began to feel that it was about time that governments tried a little bit of this recipe and saw whether they could make it work. The problem is everything hinges on your expectations of what different forms of governance can bring. And one of the things I discovered was that almost all of the politicians, the prime ministers and the presidents and even the monarchs who I was dealing with, irrespective of their particular background, their political, their party political affiliations, their personality, whatever, they all seemed to believe that there was only one international system. And it was based on fierce economic competition between nation states. And there's a very, very deeply ingrained belief amongst all politicians that by definition, anything you do that's good for your own people must be terrible for everybody else, must be bad for the planet. And anything you do that's good for the planet or good for somebody else in some other country, there must be a price to pay in the domestic environment. And this, it seems to me, is an idea which is overdue for being challenged. And that's what I'm trying to do, is to challenge that idea that you can't mix cooperation, collaboration and competition at the level of the nation state. Because frankly, if we can't do that, if we can't harmonize those approaches, then we're really in trouble. And the reason that we're in trouble is because of the nature of the challenges that we're facing in the 21st century. Huge, terrifying, systemic, globalized challenges like climate change, like migration, like poverty, like pandemics, like uh, nuclear proliferation. All of these problems, all of the challenges that the United Nations has identified in its SDGs and a few more besides, what do they all have in common? They all have in common the fact that they are beyond the capability of any individual nation state to resolve. America can't fix climate change, neither can China. The biggest countries are almost helpless in the face of most of the challenges that they uh, have to confront today. So clearly, patently, self-evidently, we need to work together if we're going to face these challenges. 
So during the last uh, 20 years or so, when I've been working in all of these different countries, of course, the governments give me a list of all the challenges they're facing, and they're very familiar challenges. They're the challenges which I see governments facing wherever I go. And as part of the process that I go through, I tend to speak to a lot of experts. I speak to climate change experts, I speak to migration experts, I speak to drug trafficking experts, and I always ask them the same question. I say, do you know what the answer to the challenge is? And they almost always say, oh yeah, we know the answer. And so I say to them, well, forgive me for being dumb, so why haven't we solved it? And they say, no, no, not dumb. The reason we haven't solved it is because we don't have sufficient resources. It's not a problem that we don't know the answer, it's that we can't afford it. And I say, well, so what do you mean resources? Surely if you were to put 5% of your economy towards this, then you'd fix it. And they say, no, 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 it's not just money, it's also the expertise, the experience, and all the rest of it. If five or six or 12 or 24 countries would get together and do it, we could probably crack it in a matter of four or five years. At which point I'm even more puzzled than before, and I say, well, what the hell is the United Nations for? Surely the whole purpose of having an international system is that it encourages countries to cooperate and collaborate and knock these problems on the head, brings together the resources, the expertise to solve these problems. Well, it turns out, of course, that the problem with the United Nations and many of these other very well-meaning organizations is that they don't have the power to knock countries' heads together because their power comes from the countries. And by definition, no country is going to grant a, uh, an international agency sufficient power to really hurt it. They're not going to hand the UN a stick with which the UN can then beat it. And so there's nothing above the level of the nation state that can really change this. So you see, it's a fine old problem. And the problem that we've got is that the challenges we're facing in the 21st century are thoroughly globalized, thoroughly interconnected, thoroughly complicated. And yet the organizations, or rather the countries that are supposed to be facing them, are still stuck in the 17th century. They regard themselves as a series of warring, competing tribes who want to come first in some imaginary race to prosperity or peace or stability or whatever the hell it is they think they want. So how is this going to change? Well, I spent, as I said, quite a few years of my life uh, quietly talking to some of these leaders and suggesting that maybe um, it wouldn't be a bad idea if they started doing some more cooperation and collaboration. Um, but they didn't listen to me, which was really frustrating, but what can you do? So I found myself thinking, well, who do they listen to? Of course, they listen to their populations. Now, I, I've only ever really worked for democratically elected governments, but I suspect that the same rule also applies to tyrants and despots. In fact, I suspect that tyrants and despots care, despots care even more about what their populations think than the uh, democratically elected governments do. Because voting for somebody and allowing somebody to remain in power are not so very different in the end. So maybe they listen to the people. And so I thought to myself, I wonder how many people there are in the world who would be prepared to go to their governments and say, the agenda has changed. And when you go to the G20 or some kind of international meeting, we don't necessarily want you to come back with the best deal for us, for your voters and for the companies in your country. Maybe we want you to come back with the best deal for our future, for our children, for the whole of humanity, for something a bit more intelligent like that. How many people would believe that? In 2014, um, I decided that it would be a good idea to try and start a debate about this, just to see how much of this kind of conversation could be stimulated. So having had previously terrifying experiences from publishing indexes, terrifying in the sense that people pay attention, and sometimes the attention is really, you desire it so much, but then when you get it, it's quite frightening. Very large numbers of people paying attention to something has something of the force of a hurricane and you find yourself staying awake 23 hours out of 24 answering emails from very angry people. But I thought to myself, it would be quite interesting to try to figure out actually which countries do cooperate and collaborate more than others and to see if we could put some kind of measurement to it. So um, with the invaluable help of my friend Robert Hovis, who I've just noticed has arrived, say hi Robert, um, we put together the thing which we call the Good Country Index. 
So I got to the topic of my speech eventually. That wasn't bad. That only took me 15 minutes. Um, what the Good Country Index does is it tries to measure, insofar as it's possible to measure, what each country on Earth contributes outside its own borders. There are, of course, dozens, if not hundreds, of other indicators out there that measure domestic performance in a, in a hundred different ways. How transparent you are, how productive you are, how competitive you are, your growth, your population, your level of peace and healthcare and all the rest of it. But all of those indicators measure countries as if they were islands, completely separate from the rest of humanity. And it's very obvious that in the age in which we live today, that's not the case. We are all connected to each other, whether we like it or not. And increasingly, it seems not, but it's a fact. Whatever goes on in one country will sooner or later affect people in other countries. So the Good Country Index looks exclusively outside. It doesn't pay any attention to domestic uh, uh, policy uh, at all. That's all measured elsewhere. If you're interested, you can find it in a hundred other surveys. So what we did was we got uh, 35 big data sets, most of which are produced by the UN system and other international organizations, which to a certain acceptable degree of robustness and reliability measure the behavior of, a, of a 160 odd countries and their impact on the rest of the world. And we divide those up between positive and negative impacts and most of that isn't rocket science. Yes, of course, we're applying all kinds of horrendous Western values onto this, but generally speaking, call me naive, but I think killing people is wrong. And if you kill somebody, you should lose a point. And if you send out a doctor to help people in another country, that's right, and you should gain a point. We can fuss about this endlessly, but I think, you know, we managed to do the Declaration of Human Rights, so we can do a good... We didn't do the Declaration of Human Rights, but we, humanity, managed to find some rough and ready... Um, <coughs> Uh, culturally neutral values that we could uh, all buy into. And then that gives us a series of rankings. And uh, it's always been controversial. Um, the very first edition, which I launched in 2014 with, uh, with the TED talk that was mentioned before, the country that came top of the ranking, always relative to the size of its economy, so we, we divide by GDP in order to create a more level playing field and not to dis disadvantage the poorer countries uh, more than necessary. The country that came top was Ireland. And this surprised a lot of people, including us. It was rather a touching result because I should explain that the data is always a few years behind the reporting because when uh, the United Nations, for example, measure uh, most of the things they're measuring in this, it takes them two to three years to do the field work, to analyze the data, and then to publish it. So we're always looking retrospectively. We're not looking at the past year. Uh, the edition that's just come out with the Netherlands on top is based on 2014 data. So don't go worrying about what you did last month that might have uh, produced that effect. It was 2014. Um, <coughs> Ireland, um, in the first edition of the Good Country Index, its top place came from 2010 data. And 2010 was the year in which Ireland's government debt was at its highest point during Ireland's uh, long and bitter economic crisis. And I just found that a very moving fact, that this country, in the depths of economic despair, without realizing it, without knowing it, without perhaps even intending it, still managed to do more good to the whole of humanity. Uh, than any other country relative to its size. Now, there's an important thing to say here. I'm not talking about altruism. I'm not talking about charity. I'm not talking even very much about aid. Aid does account for one or two of the indicators amongst the 35. But this is not that old-fashioned, uh, what in Britain we would call a Victorian model of philanthropy that all the problems of the world consist in the fact that there's a line around the middle of the globe and everybody below that line hasn't got enough dollars and everybody above the line has got far too many dollars and if only we could just transfer some of our spare dollars below the line and everything would be fine. I don't buy that model. It doesn't seem to make an awful lot of sense and it hasn't necessarily created an awful lot of improvement. I think all countries, rich or poor, large or small, have nominally got an equal responsibility to make the world work and they have to pull their weight in whatever way they can, according to their resources. So this is not about altruism. I'm not expecting states to become self-sacrificing. That would be preposterous. The idea that a government could be elected and start giving away its taxpayers' money in enormous quantities to countries that aren't quite as happy as theirs would be absurd. What I'm saying is that it's possible to do both, and this is really the fundamental point. 
surprisingly to some people, I don't, for example, have a problem with Donald Trump's creed of America first. It seems to me to be a statement of the bleeding obvious. If you're elected to be the head of state and head of government of a country, of course your first responsibility is to your own people. Duh. But what's boring and disappointing and old-fashioned about Donald Trump's worldview is that he thinks that America first means everybody else has to come last. And that's the bit that's not true. And that's the bit that's boring and old-fashioned and disappointing. I've observed every now and again, sporadically, that it's possible for governments, and not just governments, occasionally corporations and other bodies, to come up with policies that do manage magically, creatively, imaginatively, to harmonize the domestic and the international need. This is what I sometimes refer to as the gold standard of good governance that you can do policies that work well at home and work well abroad, or at least do no harm. And actually, if you do this a lot and you practice it, a miraculous thing happens. You get better. And the sheer act of bringing the international dimension into domestic policy making actually makes you more creative. My country, the United Kingdom, to which no doubt we shall refer again later on this evening, is a country that's just about managed to get itself to the miraculous stage of realizing that if you look at what Sweden does, you get votes. Because everybody thinks, wow, they're really smart. They're looking at what Sweden does and copying it occasionally. This is, if you like, the entry level of international cooper cooperation and collaboration. It would perhaps amaze you, it certainly amazed me, how very few governments even do that. Very few governments around the world even benchmark against other similar governments facing similar experiences in the past. But potentially there's so much more than that that you can do. I would suggest that even when you're tackling the most domestic of domestic issues, nurses pay in the northeast of your country, as domestic as you can possibly get, that would benefit from the international dimension. Bringing together a random collection of five or six countries Random. The more random, the better, because that's how innovative thinking happens. I suggested to the president of Sierra Leone a few years ago that he should bring together um, a group of uh, five places around the world um, to have a conversation about poverty reduction and stimulating agriculture and tourism, and that those countries should be chosen purely on the basis that they start with the same letter as his country. So it would be Sierra Leone, Sri Lanka, St. Louis, and South London. And that's quite an interesting combination. And I, it may sound absurd, but sometimes these completely randomized collections, some countries who have experience of the same problem, some who don't, some who have fixed it, some who have failed, some who are about to face that problem, some who have no idea what you're talking about, suddenly you're having a better conversation. And I found all through my life that if you bring together people with the same experience, the same cultural background, the same damn suits, and put them in the room and try to solve a problem, you will never do so, because you're just recycling the same old ideas over and over and over again. It's like working in a room with the ro when the windows are closed and no fresh air can get in. So when you start to cooperate and collaborate broadly, enthusiastically, you find that your thinking improves and you can come up with policies that are really remarkable. So, to get to the point, here we are, here's Holland, congratulations, the goodest country on the planet relative to the size of its economy, looking at the 2014 data. I think it would be really, really nice if we could treat this uh, as being a bit more like the Miss World competition than um, the Eurovision Song competition. Because the wonderful thing about Miss World, does it even still exist? I guess it does, yeah, in some part of Donald Trump's brain. Miss Universe. Miss Universe. Okay, they've got grandiose. No. <laughs> the wonderful thing about that is that when you win, that is the beginning of a year's reign. It's not a moment where you receive an award, everybody pats you on the back, and then you go on to the next one. You are then on the throne for a year, and people observe very closely what you're doing. This is how I would like the Netherlands to see coming top in the Good Country Index, if that doesn't sound too grandiose and preposterous. The fact that the Netherlands has come top of a, of a, of a list of 163 countries is much less interesting and much less important than the fact that 162 countries didn't. And have, having one really, really, really good collaborative, cooperative country in the world is not going to solve those problems. Having 163 or 205 might. So I think the question for the Netherlands, perhaps 
the grand strategy for the Netherlands over the coming year and years is to say, okay, if we figured out a thing or two about how to make this cooperation work for us, and it is working for you, you're doing well by doing good, then how can we pass that on? How can we turn that into freeware? How can we make that our thing? That's what we're known for. That's what we're good at. We're helping other countries to become gooder. Because if it's just about winning another, another award, then that's diametrically opposed to the values that are supposed to underpin the whole good country movement in the first place. So that was really my own message, apart from, of course, congratulations, and it's wonderful, and I feel personally proud because I've got sufficient Dutch DNA in me, about 50%, to feel um, that, um, that this is uh, personally rewarding. Um, I would love to see the Netherlands take this very seriously and do something very serious with it and perhaps team up with the countries that have won in the past, last time it was Sweden, and the one that comes first next year, and gradually to create a sort of movement of countries that have decided that this is the way forward for, for, for humanity. I'll leave it at that and look forward very much to um, conversation. Thank you. Um, I think I'd stay here, and I think I'd ask uh, Alexander Renorkan to join us, um, one of the chairs there. Um, Alexander Renorkan is, among many things, uh, has been University Professor of Economics and Business at the University of Amsterdam recently. Um, he's now a senator for D66, uh, the, a member of the first chamber, we call that, but has been um, on the board of ING Bank, has been rector magnificus in Erasmus University in Rotterdam, among many other things. So, um, um, welcome to you both. Um, 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 Simon, can I start out with asking you, um, so um, uh, uh, competition, in your view, is not sort of the basis of, 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 the, of prosperity and the way forward in, to the 21st century? Not alone, no. Not alone. Mm. Okay, so it's not, it's not, um, <coughs> so we're not, um, uh, uh, so the whole liberal capitalistic system is drawing to a close, or, or how do we see that? Is, are, are you a communist? Are you, I mean, are you, um, what happened to, I mean, to, to the sort of the motor of, uh, of, of international competition and wealth, uh, growth of wealth, and, you know, how do you look upon that? Am I a communist? Let's start with that. <laughs> um, I... I do remember reading um, Capital by Karl Marx and being extremely moved by it a great mm -hmm. many years ago. Um, and I had the odd thought at the time that it was one of the most Christian books I think I'd ever read. Um, but no, I am not a communist um, and I've never been able to feel any particular closeness to any party political creed. Um, most of the time, maybe this is a particularly British thing, but most of the time I look at the politicians we've got and um, I would rather not choose any of them, um, either their ideologies or their, um, or their supposed competence. But that's not really the point. Um, no, I, I suspect that, but I'm trying to get <laughs> a little bit more to the... I, I, think, um, I think what's necessary here is to um, have a conversation about globalisation. Um, to, to acknowledge that it's started to go wrong. Um, and I think most people can acknowledge that globalization has taken a few bad turnings. Um, and we need to look very hard at that. And we need, if possible, to find a way of uh, pushing the pause button and having a much, much more intelligent and responsible global conversation than we've had in the past about how we allow globalization to proceed in the future. Um, a more sustainable globalization, a more fair globalization. Mm -hmm. I think the idea that many people have not surprisingly started to espouse that globalization can be stopped or reversed is not only dangerous, well, it's dangerous because it's impossible. And there's nothing worse than people falling in love with an idea that they can't have. I think globalization is, is part of human nature. I think ever since we, we walked out of Africa and stopped being a single tribe, it's been the defining theme of human advancement to try and get back together again. And we've succeeded. We now live in an age where it is actually theoretically possible for everybody to speak to everybody. And what a shame if we should try to retreat from that um, at this point when we've nearly got it within our grasp. But we need to 
as I say, uh, we need to restart globalization in a more thinking way that's not dominated by the commercial or the trade agenda in such a, uh, as you and I were saying before um, this evening. The trade agenda, you mean the, the big um, uh, 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 treaty, the trade treaties. And that's, of course, where I'd like to see your view on that, Alexander. You're a member of a liberal party. So how do you look upon this particular part of the, the good country um, uh, index and, and sort of the basis of it? I want to begin by... Uh, oops. Uh, I want to begin by uh, congratulating uh, Simon on two accomplishments. First of all, a reading actually finishing Das Kapital by Karl Marx, which I'm sure nobody else in the room has been able to do. Certainly I haven't. So well done. I didn't say I finished it. I just said oh, I read it. Okay. <laughs> so I withdraw that compliment. Thank you. Uh, but the second one remains in place uh, because I want to congratulate you on the success of your project, your, your Good Country Index which I think is uh, a splendid accomplishment Thank and you. which I think is something we should try to learn from. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's what you invited us to do. I hope that we can make a, a small step in that direction. Of course, bask in the glory of being number one, but basically try to understand where that high score comes from mm -hmm. and what lessons we can learn and perhaps export uh, to others. So this is where we agree. Now let me immediately start uh, by disagreeing with something else you just said, because you look forward to uh, vicious debate, so here we go. Um, uh, I'm not sure that, that I agree with your assessment of globalization. Mm. Um, not in, in the sense that I would, I would say that it has brought only good to everybody. We all know that that's not the case. Mm. But I disagree uh, with the statement that you made that this is inbuilt and can never be turned back. Mm. And the reason I disagree is not that it brings me any particular pleasure, but there's unfortunately a very uh, significant historical precedent uh, and I'm sure uh, you know as well as I do that if you look at the, the history of globalization, it started to take off seriously in the early 19th, uh, the 20th century. And in fact, before World War I, Europe was more or less as globalized as it is today. It was very, very easy to travel from one country to the other, very easy to do business. I'm not talking about the world outside of Europe, but Europe alone suffices to make the point. And then, of course, we all know what happened next. We had the First World War. <laughs> Um, and the Second World War, and in between, globalization was as dead as a doornail. Nothing happened at all. And it started to pick up weekly after the war, but it took, I think, a few years to get going. And then, of course, in 1980, all of a sudden, we had this acceleration. So I am much more pessimistic, in a sense, in uh, seeing globalization as a man-made effort that you can certainly turn back. Uh, politics made it, and politics can also make it fail. So, um, while we have it, let's enjoy it and make the best, but let's not take it for granted. Mm. That is my, my, my first point. Uh, and now that we have it, let's see what it has really <coughs> brought. Um, and I think one interesting summary of what it has brought uh, that captures various of your comments is that if you look at the world uh, after a few decades of globalization, you see two interesting things. Um, if you look at income distribution, which is in a way the sort of the, the ultimate outcome to look at, you see first of all that the income distribution between countries is much more even, much more flat than it has ever been. Um, and at the same time, interestingly enough, you see that income distribution within each of these countries is less flat than it has ever been. And by the way, useful footnote, there are few countries are the exception to that final rule. This is one of them. So perhaps we have a first component of our success, that we have managed to maintain a very flat income distribution. We are really, really exceptional now. It really hasn't changed much, in fact, hardly at all, uh, during the past 10 years, where in most other countries it did, by coming much steeper than it was. So here I think you have in one statistic the good news and the bad news. The good news is, of course, that poverty has been reduced significantly. Mm. Um, and the only footnote there, from where I sit, is that a lot of that reduction uh, comes from the contribution, the success of two huge nations, India and China. Mm. If you take the India and China statistics out of the calculation, it looks much less good. Sure. But, of course, they are big and they did fantastically well. Mm. So that's all great. But at the same time, the very success of that approach seems to have created opportunities and maybe in a way that's not too surprising for the smart people to grab these chances and become pretty rich as a result. 
So in each and every one of these nations that are in a much better shape than they were, the rich are much better off, relatively speaking, than the poor, although they have both improved significantly. Yes. Um, and uh, one of the challenges, I think, of globalization, even in the Netherlands, is that where it has um, reduced global inequality in the first sense, it has increased national inequality in the second sense. And inequality is a bad thing, a really bad thing. There is lots of evidence tying grow, growing income inequality to all sorts of other really bad things. If you look at every single statistic that measures well-being, prosperity, feeling okay, mm. then all these indicators suffer when inequality goes up. Not just the fact that you have less money to spend, but also simply the atmosphere that it creates. And if for anybody doubting that statement, look at the US right now and see a country that is basically destroying its own culture at an amazingly rapid rate because inequality is just exploding from year to year and it will get worse after the tax bill that we've just seen. Or read the spirit level. Oh, indeed. Mm. Uh, but I think, uh, again, the US is by far, the, but unfortunately your country, the UK, comes in second. So um, there is really something there very fundamental also in terms of, of explaining our success. And let me wind up my, my first input by asking Simon to comment on something that struck me when I looked at his list. And, and you don't have that list in front of you, but I will just read to you the top 10 of this year's uh, global, uh, sorry, of this year's good country index. Here we go. The Netherlands, three cheers. Switzerland, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Sweden, Ireland, United Kingdom, surprise, Austria, Norway. I don't know what strikes you, but there's one thing that really strikes me, uh, two things maybe even. First of all, almost every country is European, but even more interestingly, almost every country is Northwest European. Mm -hmm. And this reads to me as the ultimate triumph of what the economists that sometimes called the Nordic model. And the Nordic model, let's be proud once again, is basically the Dutch model. The model where we have economic competitiveness on one hand, and where we have social cohesion, mm. solidarity, call it what you want, on the other hand. And the countries that do well here are the few countries in the world that score really well on both dimensions. We have a very competitive economy, very competitive economy. In fact, the top 10 that I was reading just now, it coincides very nicely with the top 10 in the Global Competitiveness Index that just measures economic competitiveness. But it also, all these countries score really well on that cohesion index. So I suspect that if you would replace your good country index by some combination of competitiveness and cohesion, mm. you would get more or less the same outcome. Is that correct? I don't know. It's worth a try. May I respond to... Yes, please, please, because it, 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 it also comes back to the, 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 the first question. Um, mm. if, if, it's, if it's, just, it's almost the same as the competitive index, mm. then it would maybe indicate to the fact that competitiveness is a very good thing in itself. In the yes. <laughs> so, so please comment on that. Uh, well, if, yeah. n if nothing else... <laughs> to be it, honest, one footnote here. Mm. There is one country that does quite well in a competitiveness index and it is conspicuously missing here, the which USA. is... Can I guess? America? Of course. The United States. No. United States. Yeah. So... Yeah. But even well, if nothing else, it does, it does reassure me and should reassure governments that um, contributing to the world and being mm -hmm. yourself competitive are not um, mutually incompatible, which is, uh, which is very good news, um, because that more than anything else is the message that governments need to hear. So le let, me, let me start at the top. Um, the question of whether globalization could, could go into reverse, could retreat, um, yes, of course, what you say is absolutely right. Uh, I think I was talking on a slightly higher time scale. Globalization has, of course, ebbed and flowed in the past, um, and uh, I would I'm as appalled as you are by the prospect of it um, ebbing suddenly as it did uh, in the early 20th century right now, which is a real possibility. But the general process, I think, um, is, is in, in, in that direction. 
I don't know. We will guess when we talk about the future. But it seems to me um, that uh, it would be quite difficult for us to, as a species, turn the clock backwards very far or for very long. Because the infrastructure is there, it's around us, it's built. The, the other point I wanted to make is that, um, of course, the term globalization is uh, a tricky one. And very often when people, particularly in North America, use the term globalization, they are nearly always talking about trade uh, and economics. And one of the things that I think it's necessary to point out is that there's much more to globalization than just money and business. Um, there is the globalization of culture, there's the globalization of communications, and the globalization of governance. There are many other good things that have happened in the name of globalization. In a sense, um, it's kind of almost a branding problem um, that people uh, associate this word, have started to associate this word globalization with a whole, uh, with, with a subset of what it really is. Um, globalization has a bad name in the same way that the European Union has a bad name. They have a rather similar issue. Um, and the reason is because so many politicians for so many years, member states in the European Union, have used the EU as an excuse for every mistake they make and have taken the personal credit for everything good that the European Union has delivered. And it's the same with globalization. Governments all over the world repeatedly blame globalization every time they screw up and take credit for everything that globalization has delivered for them. And so in that sense, both of those concepts, the European Union and globalization, have got an image issue, a communications issue. It needs to be explained that globalization is also a wonderful thing. It's also about culture. It's about stirring up um, inspiration and people and languages and race and experience. And there's a lot about it that's very, very good. The, um, the international system, which works so remarkably well and most people aren't even aware of, um, and so on. There's, there's a, a lot to be, to be said for it. Um, on the, um, the, the, the other topics, um, yeah, I do think that um, there's, a lot of, um, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting meat to be derived from the observation that all those European countries are at the top of the index. And as you say, yes, they are. Um, Northwest European. I get challenged a lot on that, as you can imagine. Um, a lot of angry Americans who are upset that the United States, which they are brought up to believe is the greatest contributor to humanity in history bar none, should come as low as 21st. Actually, my view is that 21st is rather a creditable position for the US, um, considering how deeply and profoundly engaged it is internationally, so much more than many of these other countries. The fact that it still broadly seems to do more uh, good than harm, although there we get into a question of weighting different forms of good against different forms of harm, and that's a whole other conversation. I don't think 21st is bad at all for the USA, but it is rather interesting that the US is declining quite rapidly now in the rankings. Um, I was awarded the singular honor last week of being branded fake news by Breitbart News. Um, which I was very, very pleased about. Um, it was obviously the result of a misunderstanding because they saw that America had slipped down in the rankings and immediately branded it as fake news, assuming that this was a criticism of President Trump's administration. When I pointed out to them that the figures actually come from the Obama period and whether they still thought it was fake news, they didn't answer, which was, uh, which was a shame, really. <laughs> um, but there you go. The, the, the US disengagement from the international order is an older and more complex story than Donald Trump and America first. Um, let, let, let me maybe, maybe challenge you a little yeah. bit because uh, we all, I think we all, I would imagine many people here also share a concern about developments in the United States, but mm. there's something in your approach to good country index that troubles me. Mm. Um, and, and this this maybe sounds like a, a, a cheap uh, debating trick, but nevertheless, let's assume that we draw up the good country index mm. in 1943. Mm -hmm. Um, in a period that the United States, for the second time in its history, is dispatching an army mm -hmm. to rescue Europe mm -hmm. from Nazi dictatorship, mm -hmm. um, with basically, can I use the term, uh, on pretty altruistic terms. Mm -hmm. Because surely there was very little immediate reason. We can all still be grateful that Japan declared war on the US and therefore more or less precipitated this. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I'm uh, certainly not old enough to remember the war, but I certainly am old enough to remember how my 
father felt about the Americans rescuing us, and I frankly think mm. that this is something to be deeply grateful for. Sure. And what seems to be uh, absent from your way to look at contributions that a country can make to the rest of the world is mm. precisely this, mm. that there can be just wars that mm. need to be fought, mm. and then we should be grateful for countries that don't have to wait until the UN approves, mm -hmm. and nevertheless send their troops yes. to fight also on our behalf. Yes. I'm sure you get my point. Oh, indeed I do. And, and uh, it, it's, it's one of the more common discussions that we have. Um, I get reminded about Adolf Hitler at least once a week. Um, the point about the Good Country Index is that it cannot be, of course, um, a complete account of the complexity of the world. It certainly um, can't do that. What it is trying to do is it's trying to stimulate a new way of discussing countries and their role in the world. And I know this, you accused yourself of, of, of uh, making a cheap shot. This is an even cheaper one. But the fact that we're having this discussion now means that it's working. Because, of course, it's, it's, it's going to be full of holes. To reduce the complexity of 163 countries and their interactions to a ranking is, in some respects, a preposterous endeavor. But it's still important that it exists, in my mind, because it's causing people to ask a new question about countries. Instead of constantly asking the old, old question, which is how well are they doing, it's starting to ask how much are they doing. And if the nature of that conversation is your figures don't show it, they don't reflect it, it doesn't matter. You found a flaw, perhaps, in the index, or maybe if I felt um, uh, tough, I could argue against that. But the point is we're now having that conversation. Now, you and I, arguably, would be having that conversation most days of the week anyway, if we were lucky enough to live in the same town. But a lot of people out there are now starting to have these kinds of conversations which they weren't before. And that's the ultimate aim of the, of the, the index. Of course, we're not going to give up on the idea of trying to make it fairer over time and more complete. And I hope it will continue to grow. At the moment, you could drive a, a carriage and four horses through some of the contradictions in it. And that's absolutely fine, as far as I'm concerned, because it's causing the debate to move in that direction. I was going to say the point about the European countries coming on top. Of course, that's another cause for a great deal of, of, of uh, angst around the world. And a lot of people uh, write to me and say, oh, well, you're obviously just trying to make the European Union look better. Um, well, this would be a pretty funny way of, of trying to make that point. Um, but but to me, there's a, there's a really interesting question underneath this, which is the uh, conclusion you could possibly make that the whole idea of the international community is fundamentally a Western European idea. And that's part of the reason why these countries tend to do better at it. It's a lot to do with the European Union. EU member states uh, have, of course, a long history and a habit and practice in cooperation and collaboration. The Nordics are part of a particularly collaborative group within that broader collaborative group. So it's not really surprising that we do this better than anybody else. Um, I've, I've gone on record on numerous occasions of, for saying that the European Union is the noblest experiment in the history of humanity. And you can well understand why I say that, because it's the first time in history that a group of countries has had the maturity and the wisdom to cast aside a tiny part of their own precious sovereignty for the greater good. And here's the consequence of it. These countries know how to do that. But it is our idea, and we are exporting it. And if, if, if we go a little bit into that argument uh, Alexander Enochan just made, um, because your, your index seems to suggest that non-interference in international uh, uh, politics is better, and not exporting weapons. Well, you could, you could, you could, I could see the argument of not exporting or selling weapons, mm. but the non-interference uh, again is, is, I mean, how do you look upon that if you, you, you could possibly, you could of course say, well, it's a flawed index, we're building on it, but, but, but on the merit of it, how, mm. do you, how do you look upon that? Uh, I think there are two things that you could do here um, to try to, um, to try to Im improve the quality of the comment that the index makes on, the, on this area, because it's undoubtedly a very critical issue, the one that you raise. And it's not satisfactory to say, um, well, if it's UN sanctioned, then it's all right. That's simplistic. But what else can you do because it's data-based? The problem is that we've got the tyranny of a data-based comparative index here. So this is, this is a monster that only eats data. Um, so there are two things we can do, and I hope that we will do. The first thing is to start publishing alongside the Good Country Index um, discursive country-specific reports. 
that take a look individually, separately, at what countries have done during the year in a more descriptive way. And so we can say, you know, Mozambique created a global peace center. Um, that's worthy of comment and description. That looks like a, like a good country thing to do. And then we're released a little bit from that tyranny of measurement. The other thing we can do is a technical fix, which, which I hope to do at some point, which is allow people to apply their own weighting to these issues. Because, of course, I get, I, get, um, I get people writing all the time and saying, how can you possibly say that um, the uh, Israelis uh, killing five Palestinians is, uh, should lose them no more points than the Americans releasing five tons of CO2? Well, they're absolutely right, of course. There has to be some weighting. Human justice and intelligence cry out for it. But where does the weighting come from? Not from me. I don't want to apply my own judgments to it. I don't want to apply Western judgments to it, but what we could do is we could allow people to apply their own so that eventually on the website, when we get some external funding to pay for the, for the technology, what I'd like people to be able to do is to answer a questionnaire which puts in their own values. What do you think is more important? And then it will automatically spit out their own personal good country index. And if they're American and that makes US come top for them, then they've, um, they've rigged it in the way that they accused me of rigging it in the first place. Um, I suggested just now that if you would look at a combined economic competitiveness slash uh, social solidarity index, you would get more or less the same ranking. You said Europe explains a lot, while there are some European countries that are pretty low on the index. Sure. There has to be a bit more to it than that. I have a second suggestion, hmm. um, and for an alternative index that may be essentially covering the same uh, qualities or lack of them. Um, let's call it the Enlightened Self-Interest Index. Indeed, let's. Um, because it seems to me that, uh, as in the case of human beings, when you try to figure out if they're really altruistic because they believe in some higher goal mm. or whether they have figured out that it serves them well, the same applies to nations. Yes, indeed. And frankly, I think that the Dutch were pretty good at figuring this out pretty early. Mm. And I'll give you one example um, uh, that many people here will recognize, tolerance. Um, we pride ourselves on being a tolerant nation, and surely that contributes one way or the other to the high score that we get in your good country index. But uh, all of us who know the history of tolerance, and especially the history of tolerance in our golden age, the 17th century, know that the Dutch, I think quite rightly, view tolerance as a fantastic commercial opportunity. First of all, because it attracted smart people to come here in large numbers, and precisely the people that we call refugees now uh, were the ones that were very welcome here because, first of all, they had the guts and the energy to flee wherever they came from, and that translated into commercial talents uh, and smartness that they then contributed to the nation that took them in so hospitably. And secondly, once they got here uh, and were well received because of this very reason, uh, they were still sent an occasional bill to cover the expenses of uh, tolerance, mm. because if you were from a, uh, let's call it a non-Dutch religion, uh, read non-Calvinistic brand, um, you were perfectly free to practice it in this city, provided that you, first of all, kept it out of sight, mm. and secondly, that, that you paid an occasional uh, small sum, uh, let's call it, to cover the expenses of protecting. So um, uh, tolerance was, um, perhaps a business opportunity and certainly falls in the category of enlightened self-interest. Yes. As do many of the other things that you applaud here. Yes, absolutely. So would you agree that an enlightened self-interest index would give you the same ranking as this one? Um, on the day we decide that we need to rename it, it's very likely that that would be one of the things we'd call it. Um, it sounds so much less nice. <laughs> yes, it does. I mean, few things irritate me more than the questioning of people's motivations for doing good. I got into a furious argument with a corporate social responsibility person who was plaguing uh, Nike or some other company because uh, they were doing the right things for the wrong reasons. And I found myself saying to her, well, when was the last time you did anything worthwhile? I mean, you know, we have so much need for good in this world that it seems to me to be m monstrous to challenge people's motivations for doing good. Just let them get on with it, for heaven's sake. In any case, there's a fundamental uh, trait in human nature that many people start off doing good for entirely self-interested reasons. And then the moment they start to receive the warmth of people's uh, respect and admiration, they become addicted to it. 
and they will start. They will continue to to uh, to behave in that way. In fact, they'll start doing anything in order to maintain that feeling of being admired, even being genuinely good, if that's what it costs. Um, so so uh, so I don't. I'm not interested in people's motivations at all. Um, this is not, as I said before, about ph philanthropy or altruism. That would be preposterous. Um, Actually, one of the interesting, uh, you talk about correlating this index with other indicators. Um, there's an annual uh, study I've been running since 2005, which measures global perceptions of countries. And um, uh, Robert and I discovered that there is a more than 70% correlation between that index and this index. So the countries that do the most good, broadly speaking, also have the best reputations. And the countries that have the best reputations are the ones that get most trade, most tourism, most foreign investment, sell most goods, get the best diplomatic treatment, and so forth. So and light and self-interest. Absolutely. And what, what are we, um, if you move on a little bit, what are we doing good? Um, because if you closely look at the index, um, um, we didn't get any gold medals in any category. So, no. um, so we're doing a lot of things quite good. You're not doing anything very badly. Okay, that you could put it like that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is interesting. It's an interesting way of putting it. Yes, that, so, that's true also for the global competitiveness index. By the way, it's, if, I don't know if anybody ever looked at it. It's mm. it's really great stuff, because with due respect, it's even more detailed than than yours. Sure. Uh, I really recommend it. It makes very interesting reading. So you have twelve categories. Each category has about mm. ten indicators. Mm. Lots of data. Yeah. And, uh, They've got a team of about 45 economists working on well, it. Well, okay, okay. No, I'm not blaming you at all, but it's, I'm just uh, mm. sharing this with the audience mm. um, at home and here. Um, uh, but if you, the first time you see the Dutch uh, score, the first thing you want to know is where are we doing really badly and where are we number one? Mm. And I, I'll tell you where we are number one. Uh, in, in two categories, two, two indicators. The first indicator is maritime infrastructure. Not so surprising, and the canals, we've, we've, and we have a big harbour, everything, yeah. everything about yeah. Rotterdam. So that's one. The second thing is very strangely under the heading of malaria. Uh, there are two indicators there: number of patients, zero; uh -huh. impact on business, zero. So malaria and maritime infrastructure are two strong points. Uh, maybe not what you had anticipated, and we have one really weak point. And now that's interesting how that would figure in your category. And that, can anybody guess what our weakest point is? Guess. Pollution? Not good, but certainly no other countries. Much, much worse than we are. Much worse. Soil? Sorry? Soil? No. Space. Labor market flexibility. There we are, I think, 125th or so out of 140. You cannot be fired, basically. There we, that's more or less it. No. Um, so um, do we want to change that? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that's even that bad. But how would that figure in your index? Labor market flexibility. Yes. Uh, it's not really a good country issue. Well, indirectly, but then everything is indirectly. I mean, the dividing line between domestic and international isn't a line anymore, but you have to draw it somewhere. Um, I mean, obviously, labor market flexibility has got something to do with the employment of migrants, but we measure treatment of migrants, arrival of migrants and so forth <coughs> elsewhere in the index. So that, se that feels to me to be slightly, I mean, you, you put me on the spot here, but that feels to me to be slightly too domestic to be in included in the... But, and, but what are we? What what are we good at? We are. Um, wh why did we come to the top of the list? What what have we been improving? Or what's Robert, do you know these off the top of your head? <laughs> How very disappointing! I always assumed that you'd <laughs> memorized every single. Uh, there we go. Here, here we have. Um, yeah. So prosperity and equality, the contribution to prosperity and equality, which is about trade, basically. So the amount of foreign investment that the Netherlands uh, does elsewhere, outbound. So you don't, this, is, this is like one of yours, Alexander. Number of refugees generated from Holland. <laughs> Zero. <What? laughs> Ah, yes, the, the very, very strong contribution to the international order. So 
for example, the speed with which uh, the Netherlands signs UN treaties um, doesn't hang around for 10, 15, 20 years, which is a real nuisance, uh, the countries that do take forever to do that. Uh, and so forth. It's all good, worthy stuff, you know, and, and what it amounts to is a very clean copybook. Um, and the Netherlands performs less badly on international peace and security than many Western European countries. That's the category where most of the Western democracies score very badly, um, partly because of huge quantities of weapons exports. Call me old-fashioned, but I think selling guns is, is wrong. Um, and as we were discussing before, uh, the number of casualties you're responsible for uh, in other I, Again, I don't, I don't want to pull a cheap trick here, but yeah. do you think that a world without guns is possible? Possible? Yeah. I'm, I'm not here to talk about possible. Okay, but do, let me put it differently. Do you think that guns can occasionally be put to good use? No. For instance, a policeman carrying a gun, is that, does that make sense? Well, we managed perfectly well in my country with truncheons up until about three years ago. Much longer ago, I think. Uh, but anyhow, um, given the fact that you've mm. e even you have stopped doing that, do you think that policemen are, if we have a, we have a safer country, if policemen carry guns? Well, there's the... And my next question will be, if so, where should they be produced? <laughs> they should be produced by the United Nations under strictly control. No, I'm joking. Um, Yes, of course, one of the definitions of a democratic state is that the state has a monopoly on the instruments of force. And if you trust your state, absolutely, um, then there should be no reason to fear armed police, or indeed armed soldiers. But as I said before, you've got to draw the line somewhere. And if we start saying, OK, guns under certain circumstances are legitimate and therefore the manufacture of weapons under certain circumstances is legitimate, where does that leave the index? I start saying, well, the Italians, now they've got Beretta and they make a large number of quite attractive pistols. James Bond's favourite Yes, gun. which are sold all over the world. But I think that they're very careful about making sure that they don't go to the wrong people. So we won't dock too many points from it. You see what I mean? It becomes impossible. So you have to find a place where you can draw a line, however um, difficult it is to pin that down. I have a suggestion. Yeah. Because this is an issue that has troubled, believe it or not, bankers. Mm who are not very conscientious about what they do and not do in the most of the time, but there has been an effort to indicate categories of arms manufacturing that bankers simply should not fund. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there you find nasty things like cluster bombs. Sure. Uh, and so chemical, countries... Chemical weapons. And chemical still, weapons. Yeah. Yes. Cluster, so countries that build them and export mm. them, I think, mm. really deserve lots of negative brownie yes. points. Well, case. this is one of the directions that we're, we're looking at for future, for future indexes. When we've, got the, when we've got the staff and we've got the capability, and more importantly, when the data is available. Because the difficulty with an index like this is you're looking at 165 countries. And so whatever data you use has got to be available for all of those countries. Otherwise, it's not fair on the ones that aren't included. And that's the challenge. But over time, I would hope we'll get to the stage where we can actually do some of our own primary research and then we can start being much more subtle about the way that we, that we execute. Talking this. about chemical weapons and producing it, and we're doing in Holland actually very bad uh, in your index, in mm. the good country index, on pesticide export, mm. and, um, uh, which is, uh, I'm a staunch environmentalist, um, uh, so we, we, we're making a lot of money out of um, uh, exporting pesticides. Mm. And what, what do you think about that, Alexander? Well, I, it's, I would repeat the previous conversation. Um, but maybe you can simply start by uh, saying that, at least as a hypothesis, there are a good pesticides. Sure. I would not entirely you agree, but... <laughs> you agree. <laughs> but okay, then, then the debate is between the two of us. Are you serious? Do you think that well, there is no useful role well, there that is, there men is some, made? There is some, of course. But, pesticides. But, but, Look at the way the Chinese... Okay, this is an interesting uh, test case. Uh, um, if, if you travel to China, I don't know how many of you have been there, uh, but the one thing that struck me when I visited there first is that I traveled uh, away from the big cities and something was wrong. Um, and uh, it took me a long time to realize what was wrong. But the answer was no birds. You heard no birds. Zero. And the reason we now know was because the Chinese used enormous quantities of pesticides 
to increase the productivity of their crops. But in doing so, basically eliminated all the food, the natural foods that birds feed on. So there were just no birds left. Insects. So this is clearly an example that will please you. But the trick, of course, is to increase productivity because we really need more productive crops uh, to survive as a globe, have enough to eat. But to do it in such a way that there is no damage to anything uh, other category than the kind of in, uh, bacteria or whatever that we want to be damaged. Mm. And this, I think, is where the Netherlands has a lot to offer because we have Wageningen. Mm. And Wageningen is the number one agricultural university in the world. So if they develop these kind of pesticides and if they are strongly exported, I think we should earn plus points mm. and not negative points. Mm. Let's not yeah. go entirely into agricultural policy, but just to, to comment on this um, uh, very briefly. Um, it's precisely because of Wageningen that um, uh, there is no birds left in, in China, because they have been heavily sponsored by Bayer, who is the biggest producer of this stuff, mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to generate pesticides which are indeed very bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's the, 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 the flip side of what you said. You know, we, we ought to be very uh, uh, going down in the brownie points uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Arnold is giving out, because we're doing bad damage mm -hmm. all over the world Did. because of mm -hmm. the research <laughs> doing that. We're. But, well, let's hope. Let's hope so. But at the, <laughs> at, at, at the risk of sounding facile, you see, this is the perfect good country conversation. This is exactly what we're supposed to generate. Because of the fundamental impossibility of saying a thing is wholly good or wholly bad, I mean, there are 35 indicators in there. We've touched on two of them. There's not a single one that you couldn't have the same identical conversation about and say some X is good and some X is bad. It's not wholly good, it's not wholly bad. It depends on the circumstances, it depends on the country, it depends on their level of economic development. And that's, <coughs> and that's the whole point. In trying to draw this impossible line between good and bad, in trying to create this impossible <coughs> distinction between good behaviors and bad behaviors, we are generating finally serious conversations about what countries do outside their borders. And that's exactly what I wanted to achieve. Robert wanted to say something, Robert, can I? No, it's just that it's it's hazardous pesticides, yes. Yeah. So, so hazardous pesticides, I'm saying to the viewers on the internet, yeah. because they wouldn't hear you. Oh, no, you're, you're, you're yeah. hazardous pesticides. Yeah. So, so in this case, in this case, the data is available yeah. because the UN do distinguish in their in their data collection okay. between hazardous and non-hazardous. All weapons are hazardous. Unfortunately, we don't have the the same uh, <laughs> the same distinction. Good cop guns versus bad cop guns. And Alexander, you touched upon this a little bit, but um, and we have in Holland, of course, and uh, Simon, you're probably aware of that, but we, we see ourselves as a nation of uh, vicars and merchants mm. and uh, with a tolerance uh, a conversation, um, uh, which is sort of the same, touches on the same thing. But what, Alexander, what would you, if we now topping the list of uh, the good country, uh, as of the good country index, um, so we're the goodest country, what, what, what would that make us? Merchants or, 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 or vicars? I, I, what would that do for our image? And Smart vicars. Smart vicars. <laughs> I think that is really what we have become over time. And also somewhat selective in where we allow our moral judgment to override our commercial interests. But we've discovered that in many occasions these are just uh, basically parallel purposes and not necessarily contrarian. They're aligned. So we, I think we've become smart vicars, um, which is not a bad thing to be. Maybe that's a, that's a good sort of uh, um, uh, a slogan for the, the, the government your party is in now. There's Christians in it. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is very interesting. Can I do a little <laughs> plug for one of the projects that we're doing at the moment? We're, we're, we're just starting work on something called the Policy Playbook. And it sounds very dull. Um, and perhaps it will be quite dull at the beginning, but the idea is we want to make a, a, a book which is a collection of the 100 best policies that have been carried out by, by governments in real situations over the last 20, 30 years or whatever, which, have, which successfully demonstrate that you can reconcile your domestic and international responsibilities. I bet the Dutch government has done a few, so perhaps um, this could be a call for examples. Uh, anything that's happened in this country, which is a good illustration of 
uh, how you can do the right thing domestically no, and internationally at the same think, time. I uh, think development aid is not, uh, the very first example that comes to mind. But, but that's what Simon Annan just called, it might, it might be a Victorian age, you know, uh, transferring your money from uh, above no, no, the but equator. But that's the old fashioned. That's no. I, I'd uh, say no to that for a different reason. It's not, it's not because there's anything necessarily wrong with development aid, but just because that's intrinsically international anyway. When countries do development aid, aid by definition, they're thinking about the world outside their borders. What I'm much more interested in is the domestic policies uh, that have... But the Dutch way to do development aid... Tell me about it. Then. ...is to link it to trade policy. Right. And to see if we can, in some objective sense, hopefully, and make sure that when we export mm. jobs to uh, developing countries, mm. uh, we can get Dutch companies involved in that export effort. Mm. Uh, so, of course, you have to be very careful. Um, the, the room to maneuver is limited. We try to live by OECD rules. We cannot mm. unilaterally impose on developing countries that they can only spend their money in the Netherlands. Mm. But we can certainly work very hard to make that happen. And Dutch companies, I think, are quite willing to develop themselves in these developing countries in such a way that the greater good of the population is served. Mm. And, you know, there are more and less visible examples of this. Well, for instance, uh, uh, Heineken, uh, com a company that you can have all sorts of opinions about, did fantastic work in Rwanda <coughs> by staying there in the first place and by making sure that their employees had much better medical services, for instance, than any other category of employees in that part of the world. So, and of course, they made money on beer. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, uh, even in development aid, if you will, there are these examples as well. Yes. As a matter of fact, the Dutch Development Agency adopted a proposal of mine that I wrote in a, in a, in a book I wrote many years ago, which was to work with entrepreneurs in developing countries sure. to help them create their own global consumer brands. And the Dutch would help to distribute and market those and create Fantastic. sustainable wealth. That's a very good example. Yeah. And some other thing which is uh, telling again, um, it's, it's a telling thing about who we are, who the Dutch are. Um, you, you, no, n I p pointed out earlier that in your in your lists, the Dutch don't come, uh, uh, don't never ever score first place, mm. and we're very frustrated about it as a mm. country by our our. our uh, never ever winning, you know, the big global uh, golden medals in in in. in but I in, gave you one. In fo football and stuff like that. Mm. But but yeah yeah you you did and I think we're very happy about that. You and see this is so Dutch. Such. You come first in the whole bloody index, and what do you do? You complain that you're not first in any of the categories. <laughs> exactly. That's that's it's it's. It's, uh, we're, we're complaining, of course, yes. we're always, we're as, as a country. But also, um, it might be a very good thing that we never ever actually achieved like the first place, but mm. we're doing nothing wrong. Yes. That it might be more important than doing something very good. Is that well, if everybody did no harm, then we'd certainly be in a better place than we are today. I mean, yeah, your, your point is un undoubtedly an interesting one, but I have to say, in the context of the Good Country Index, the fact you don't happen to be first, um, but you're in the top 20 in most of them. There are 163 countries in this index. So the difference yeah. between first place and sixth place or 12th place is statistically insignificant. It really doesn't mean a thing, mm -hmm. which is not the same thing as saying that you coming first is statistically yeah. insignificant. But uh, on the individual categories, it doesn't mean a whole lot. No, but, but maybe we should be more uh, um, allowing ourselves to be happy with the fact that you know, we, in a broad spectrum we're performing quite well. Because we're always, always complaining that we don't have a Harvard or an, or an Oxford yes. in our country, but all the universities are very high in the international rankings. My dream, Not, I will tell you my no. dream, my dream is that the stimulus of coming top in the Good Country Index would be sufficient to encourage the Netherlands to start being more proactive about this behaviour. Um, because you have a long experience of doing it rather quietly and rather effectively and self-interestedly, which is, which is great. Um, but actually daring to lead uh, hasn't been so visible. Um, and maybe that's part of your character. Um, this strange combination of humility and arrogance, which I've so often observed. Um, but maybe this is the moment. How, how should the government go about? You know, what, does it, what does it say about our foreign policies? Our what, what should Halbert Hellstra take from this? Well, I think this basically, uh, we have people in the room from the ministry that is responsible for our foreign policy. Maybe we should get the audience. Yeah, we, we are. The this opportunity is the for joining closing here. question. I would hope uh, that the foreign ministry feels encouraged by this outcome because basically this says that we are sort of doing the right things. We are not 
we have not withdrawn, we are active. Uh, but we are active in at least uh, a way that generates a very positive impression from an informed observer like you. Mm. So this is, I think, a cause for a huge celebration. Every, every single uh, government of the 52 countries I've advised over the last 20 years, mm. the first question, the only question really that I've ever asked them is, what is your gift to the world? Why do you as a country exist? What justifies the territory that you occupy on the planet's surface? Why should people feel glad that the Netherlands is here? And if you can answer that question, then you're well on your way to having a grand strategy, which is what countries desperately need. You and also it, answer by saying uh, the Concertgebouw and its orchestra. Okay. It's the beginning of a longer answer. <laughs> it's also a pretty good answer anyway. Is there anybody who wants to come in into the uh, comment or come in the conversation? Over there. Um, I'm Frans Bonsma. I've read a lot about... Um, at first of all, I want to thank you, because I think you're great, inspiring, the way you talk, the idea, fantastic. I want to thank you very much for that. Thank you, Will. Um, but after that, I would like to say that I feel that uh, we are um, having now a very positive discourse about uh, the Netherlands and about uh, America even, uh, by Alexander. But um, uh, I think there is a discourse that we hear all the time from our television and radio and newspapers and other media that is repeated all the time. But what I've read is, for instance, Noah Ch Noam Chomsky, that is supposed to be, according to the uh, New York Times, the best number, uh, the best intellectual living right now, he said that during the Second World War, the United States was thinking about the way after the war, when Western Europe would be down and very weak, to take over the hegemony of the world. And that uh, puts the idea that it was so altruistic uh, to come into the war in a different view, I think. Ah. That's number one. And okay, the well second... I Mm -hmm. and, second, yes. and the second one is that we are talking about uh, development aid, and whereas um, in total the development aid that comes from the rich countries to the poor countries is 125, um, uh, how do you say that, billion, uh, milliard we say, billion uh, dollars, whereas trillions of dollars every year comes back in the way of resources from poor countries to rich countries, in the way of repaying on debt, in the way of um, chicaneing, uh, I, uh, I, I'm not sure that that is an English word, um, with the um, uh, papers that are uh, sent with the goods. So trillions of dollars come from the rich countries to the poor countries. No, no, so the, the, I don't, the other, I don't way, the other way, the other way around. You mean from the poor countries to the rich countries? From the poor countries. So, in the Guardian, for instance, they said we are being developed by the developing, developing countries instead of the other way around. So, my question is, why aren't? Uh, no, that's not my question. My question is, this is what I just said. Uh, specifically to you, Simon, is that this I don't find in your, um, in okay. your so there's, there's just good index. The, the first yeah. one maybe is for Alexander. Alexander, you've got to attack Noam Chomsky. That's your job. <laughs> well, um, and the American foreign policy during the Second World War. It's tempting to see conspiracies wherever you look. And this is possibly an irresistible temptation to Mr. Chomsky. But frankly, no, 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 no. Excuse me, excuse me. We're not going to talk to and fro because you're not being heard on the internet. So sorry, we're not. Um, let me just finalize that. That's because I, I don't think this is um, a, a particularly fruitful area to pursue. Um, if you look into why the United States entered the war, uh, I said already we should be grateful to Japan for unilateral declaring war on the United States because otherwise it probably wouldn't have come at all. Uh, and maybe that on its own is already a counter-argument because if there was this big conspiracy to rule Europe, then surely they would not have needed this particular incident to move in to begin with. But they did, um, uh, reluctantly, because there was a lot of isolationism in the United States in the, the early 40s. 
with very prominent people supporting it. Charles Lindbergh is an interesting case in point. Uh, so that all of that had to be overcome. Um, and, and the then president, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, probably deep in his heart was quite ready to move and support the struggle for democracy in Europe, but was very grateful for the opportunity that the Japanese offered. And even then, it was somewhat of a struggle to pull the American war machine together. And if you look at what America did after the war, then again, it's only fair to say that whatever their ultimate design may have been, the very fact that so much martial aid was invested into the recovering European economies was an extremely generous gesture of which we have greatly benefited. So, so, no, no, so no, no, there no, is sorry, evidence sorry, on the not. other side as well. And Simon, um, about the global economic system, did you take that into account? The trade going from south to north and north to south? If the... Um, in theory, that is there um, in, the, in the Good Country Index. Because, for example, if, um, uh, if for example, the, um, a developing country is investing heavily in an industry in a non-developing country, that will show up in the data and they will gain rank as a result of that. So most of these economic flows should be, uh, should be captured in the Good Country Index. We're not deliberately capturing them in any particular direction. As long as the ITC or the World Bank or whoever is data we're using for these uh, particular indicators are capturing the flows, then in theory they're all captured. Can I, um, say, can I add something to that? Mm -hmm. um, the statistic that you quote is somewhat misleading in, in two ways. Uh, first of all, um, if you look at the official development aid flow to, for instance, Africa, it's a small fraction by now of foreign direct investment. So the relevance of that money stream, if you will, has gone down in time uh, significantly. And it still decreases every year. Uh, and that is good news. Good news, I would mention it's good news, because it basically means that we see productive opportunities there and are ready to invest in their success. And so the flows going back that you complained about, the trillions, uh, to a very small extent reflect scarce resources uh, going out of the country at a price that you can dispute, possibly too low, but the large majority of the money coming back are simply exports. Uh, that basically pay a positive tribute to the quality of the underlying economy. If the Dutch export as much as they do, surely this is not something that we should be pitied for, but complimented for. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody else trying to join? Yes, please. Uh, Arte van Buiten is my name. Um, at some level, there's an interesting parallel to what uh, Michael Porter calls shared value uh, among businesses. Uh, doing well by doing good. Um, and I was wondering how you see that relationship, because obviously when we want to tackle the huge issues, climate change, you mentioned others, um, then only countries cannot do the trick as well. So they, we need to collaborate, you know, countries, businesses, NGOs, everybody needs to pitch yes. in. So how do you see that uh, progress? Um, thanks for the question. Well. Um, I, I guess what I haven't really talked about is the is the the good country project in its in its broader sense because for obvious reasons we've been talking about the index um, this evening and I I I really hope that I don't end up spending the rest of my life measuring things um, <laughs> partly because I'm very bad at it uh, and partly because um, that would be sad. Um, what would be really much more interesting would be as if one could uh, start to create something of a change in the culture of governance. What this, that's what this is really all about. And of course, when you're doing that, you have to look beyond governments, because of course, power doesn't reside only in the nation state. I tend to focus on the nation state for this exercise because it's where the data is available, but also because nation states are very powerful. Um, and of course, one can spend hours in fascinating discussions about whether the nation state is on its last legs or whether we're going back to um, the Renaissance uh, model of city-states. Those are all fascinating conversations. But I'm in a hurry. And so I think that we need to deal with the structures that we've got at the moment, which is nation-states. However, corporations are very important. 
And we could have had a rather similar, perhaps equally interesting conversation this evening talking about the good corporation and what does that mean. But the interesting thing is that, yet again, the corporate world, for various reasons, seems to have got there much earlier than the governmental world. In many ways, this uh, argument resembles the argument of corporate social responsibility. Um, that uh, if you want to, <coughs> that, that famous phrase again, if you want to do well, you have to do good. And Alexander mentions enlightened self-interest. Um, th this is a, a well-understood uh, mechanism and it needs to be exploited more carefully. There are many, many levels at which this, um, this mandate of trying to remember your external as well as your internal responsibilities and the benefits that come from doing that imaginatively, that can apply at so many different levels. And one of the nice things about the good country model is that it does articulate quite happily at much smaller levels than the nation state. Now, I find that my average brain gets quite tired thinking for hours on end at the level of the planet and of nation states. And I'm certain that the same is true for most of the people who are interested in it. And therefore, it's absolutely essential that we should find ways of, as I say, articulating these discussions at different levels. What would a, go a good town be like? What would a good city be like? I've been having fascinating conversations recently about what a good university would look like. Not in the sense of the good university guide, because that's the best university, you know, will uh, a student get a better job at the end of it. But in exactly the, on exactly the same model, is this a university that remembers its obligations outside its own campus to the city or region in which it is, as well as the wider world, as well as its obligations to its own teaching staff, its students, and all the rest of it? This. Uh, is it will not be a surprise to Alexander to hear, it would be a competitive advantage for a university um, because universities are desperate uh, to get uh, students uh, who feel good about studying at one particular place more than another. Um, what is a good village? What is a good school? Uh, amongst the most enthusiastic recipients of the good country message are, believe it or not, school children. I do loads of talks at schools and the kids absolutely love this because it, depending on which generation you grew up in and the level of cynicism that you've taken on board as a result of getting old and being born earlier and having to deal with mortgages, um, generally speaking, <coughs> They're not cynical about this at all. It seems absolutely logical to them. My own uh, children see this message of uh, celebrating cultural diversity and the good things that come with globalization as absolutely innate and instinctive. Why wouldn't you think that's a good thing? So that's one of the reasons I tend to feel hopeful about the whole thing, because there's a natural process of this message spreading. But I'll tell you something which, which uh, really struck me. Um, after I'd given that TED talk um, back in 2014 when I launched the Good Country Index, I started receiving large numbers of emails from people all over the world, and not just countries where you expect people to watch TED talks the whole time, saying the most touching things, like, I've been waiting for somebody to say this stuff, and now you've said it. What do you want me to do? And I found myself thinking, I wonder how many people do share this idea that it would be better to be collaborative than competitive. So uh, Robert and I did a bit of research using the, um, the World Values uh, Survey, um, which is a brilliant piece of research that enables you to look into the minds of large numbers of people around the world. And very back of the envelope stuff, but we discovered that a very conservative estimate, no less than 10% of the world's population are natural, inborn, really hardcore cosmopolitans. They're the sort of people who would instinctively, instantly say that they are a human being before they are a citizen of their own nation. It's not that they lack patriotism, but they just feel human first. I'm like that. I don't know how many other people in the room are like that. 10%. Now, 10% doesn't sound like a very big number, but that's 700 million people. And 700 million people would make quite a movement if you managed to get them all together. And so the ultimate aim, of course, is for the good country to become a country. I'm not quite sure who I'm quoting when I say this. I have a horrible feeling it may have been Hitler, you'll correct me, that what the world needs is a moral state. Uh, because you don't choose your country, you're born into it. The good country index shows that even the countries that come at the top are very far from being truly moral. Um, and what we really need is a powerful agent with the resources of a nation state that exists 
by the choice of its citizens to do well for the international community and the future of the planet. And then we come to what's a good, a good person, a good village, a good person, and then you come to the good book, of course, before you know. But anyhow. Um. So we, we're, we're going to have 700 million people around the world paying $1 taxes each year to fund this moral virtual state of which they can become citizens. You wanted to come in on this point, Alexander? I want to. I'm looking at the clock, and, and yeah. I want to have a fine opportunity to come Yep, yeah, the, the, the mic. Sure. Yeah. To comment, and I'll, um, uh, first of all, uh, a comment. Um, if we are looking for uh, supranational mechanisms to enforce goodness, then, of course, the number one example that I would think of is Europe. Mm -hmm. And what I really hope is that we can manage to change the perception of Europe as being a, let's call it just a faithful and dumb ally of globalization uh, into the, what Macron calls so nicely, l'Europe qui protège, Europe that protects, that at the end of the day be really also was designed and intended to safeguard its citizens from the nasty side effects of globalist capitalism at its, at its worst. That fills me with despair. L'Europe qui protège. I mean, that's 27 countries looking inwards. Is that no, any better no, than no, one no, country looking it's, inwards? It's 27 countries accepting their international role, being part of a global mm. open economy, but also accepting mm. that to make globalization work, mm. you cannot accept its results without trying to alter their impact mm. and without protecting those who necessarily suffer from any disruptive economic change. Mm. Or protect that the environment. That is what protect them. stands for. Okay. Well, my final no. question, if I may. To, oh, yeah. to, oh uh, I thought uh, it was a remark. This no. was a comment. Yeah. No. My final question. I've looked uh, in the re outcomes to see if they reflect any personal bias mm. from you, Simon. And I've only discovered two. Mm. Um, because we know that you are uh, semi-Dutch and semi-English. Mm -hmm. So the first part explains the high score of the Netherlands. That is sort of the easy part. But Blame now, the Dutchman who actually did the numbers. It makes it even worse. <laughs> um, but now the second part. Mm. And the one thing that really strikes me is the high ranking of the United Kingdom. Mm. Uh, number eight on your list. Mm. And uh, please confirm that the only reason this ranking is as high as it is, mm. because it was based on pre-Brexit data. Oh, for sure. But I mean, even if it was based on even if it was based on 2017 data, that would be pre-Brexit data because Brexit hasn't happened yet. Um, but the referendum did. Yeah, the referendum did. But uh, this is measuring real behaviour. This is not measuring perceptions. Um, uh, so, is there any hope for the UK score going forward? Um, no. Good. That's Don't get me started. <laughs> that's that's clear. Then. <laughs> it's, it's too late. We should have started off talking about Europe. In England, in Great Britain, yeah, you should have. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, but it's too late now. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. We will see. But yeah. Um, uh, sorry, you you were talking about the seven hundred million people on Earth who, the ten percent, and it sounds somewhat like the elite. Like, um, you know, the... Uh, the, the global people, elite. The low global yes. elite, w yes. w who feel at home globally everywhere, mm. whatever, at Starbucks and, and things like that. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but the problem is that the rest, the 90%, mm. there is a, a, a movement against those 10%, because people feel, I don't know what, but they don't feel at home at those, with, those, with the elite. So how do, do, do the, these 10% well, convince the 90% that this is the right way. Interestingly enough, it's not an elite. Um, one of the fascinating things that came out of this research is that more than anything else, it seems to be a character trait rather than a demographic trait. Um, I mean, yes, of course, it's easy, a, a, a prominent subset of that 700 million are, of course, your, um, your, your cappuccino sipping um, uh, digital nomads, but they're only a subset. And one of the things that's really very, um, very striking from my inbox, apart from anything else, is the number of people who write strongly sharing these views who uh, don't come from Western Europe or North America. A great many of them come from South Asia. A great many of them are really not very well educated. Um, it seems to be a character trait. And this is one of the qualities that um, most of all, this is one of the areas that I want to examine more closely, because it doesn't seem to fit the demographic model that one might assume. 
Your other question, of course, still stands, which is how are the 10% going to persuade the rest? Um, well, we'll see. I think that if you look at um, the theorists of uh, human development, which is a not unadjacent science, they come up with similar sorts of numbers. And the general assumption is that there's a much larger cohort behind the hardcore who would, of course, uh, follow this kind of vision if it were presented to them. But they're just not aware of it or they're unsure. And this is, there's a really, really important thing that I'd like to say. Can I take two minutes just to say this very briefly? Yes, you can. OK. I, I, um, I gave a talk at the end of last year um, and about the, this other uh, project which I launched called The Global Vote. Um, the Global Vote is a, is a platform that lets people anywhere in the world vote in other countries' elections. It's a kind of celebration of interdependence. It's kind of fun. And, uh, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of people all over the world voting for the next president of Sao Tome and Principe and, uh, and, and all kinds of fascinating places like that. Um, and I gave, a, I gave a talk in Frankfurt to launch this. And in that talk, I used a phrase which I'd previously come up with, which I was very proud of. And the phrase was, it's no longer a struggle between left and right, between capital and labor. That distinction no longer exists. It's now a struggle between inwards and backwards and outwards and forwards. The people who find their comfort looking back in history and inwards towards their own kind against the people who find their hope looking forwards to the future and outwards to the rest of the world. And I felt really pleased with that formulation. I thought that's going to get quoted. Um, and when I got home, um, I received um, an enormous number of hate mails uh, from people who are actually members, followers of the good country, basically saying, I thought you were smart, but you're just an asshole like the rest of them. So I wrote back to them and I said, what's the problem? And they said, look, I voted for Trump. I'm not an idiot. I know about history. I believe in the future too, but I happen to think that this model is better. And a number of other people who said, I voted for Brexit, but I'm not an idiot. How dare you talk down to us like this? And I suddenly, a little light bulb appeared over my head and I thought, if all the good country ends up being is more tribal warfare between the educated liberals and the poor, ignorant nationalists, then it's making the problem worse, not better. And the thing that I'm spending all of my effort trying to figure out now is a message that's meaningful to both sides. Because if all we do is increase that divide between the backwards and, you know, they have a point too. They're suffering for very good reasons. They're not all stupid. And they might very well be persuaded to differ, take a different path in the future if a better one was available to them. So that's what I'm struggling with. Any suggestions, please, on a postcard or an email? It's tricky, but possible. Thank you for the closing remark. Um, we're not yet done. It's not as easy as uh, just a liberal index for the global uh, nomads and uh, the people who feel at home in Starbucks. Yeah. Um, and less and less people are feeling at home in Starbucks as we see as how they e avoid taxes. Again, a problem of the global um, uh, uh, well-off and the, and, and the remainers. So yes, um, uh, thank you very much for um, uh, joining us uh, tonight. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alexander Rinoikan. Thank you very much, Simon Anhold, for um, 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 giving us this gold prize, this gold medal, which we've been um, um, uh, much uh, craving for a long time in our country. So we're, we're at home with ourselves now. We're uh, smart vicars. Um, we found a new uh, motto, logo, um, for our uh, uh, Rutte, Rutte III cabinet, which is great. I think it, it fits Christian Democrats and Christian Union and Liberals uh, uh, both very well. Don't forget the communists. Uh, yes, we, we, we discussed communism. We found out that it's, uh, uh, it's a difficult book to read. And um, uh, thank you very, very much. The third half of this, uh, of this, e of this conversation might be in the bar, continuing uh, the conversation. Thank you very, very much for coming over. Thank you. And sharing your uh, index with us. Okay, this is... Uh, Thanks. I see you. Um, <laughs>